So good afternoon and welcome everybody to another Thursday gathering. And today we have June Scott who is going to talk to us about a cultural exchange that she made in Cuba. It's my pleasure to introduce she you. She is a widow and her exploration has taken oh. her to 50 states and 96 countries. June believes that travel broadens one's vista and perspectives politically, personally, and culturally. And no matter where you travel, you will just keep learning and come home with a good appreciation of how much we are much more alike than we are different. So it's my pleasure today to introduce June, who is going to talk about a cultural exchange in Cuba. So welcome, June. Thank you, Janet, very much. Um, and hello to everybody. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's so nice to be with you. And as Janet um, said, I'm going to take you on a cultural exchange to Cuba. And by a cultural exchange, I mean that we had to have a letter of invitation from the uh, Cuban government. And we had to follow their rules and regulations. And of course, um, they uh, were happy to have us and the people were very curious and very welcoming to us as we, you know, entered there. And I went with Overseas Adventure Travel, uh, Grand Circle. And usually they have all sorts of activities and they'll say, you can go or you don't have to go. But this one, we had to definitely go and be part of everything because it was an exchange between people and uh, uh, rebuilding um, our friendships between the two countries. And um, it was a wonderful opportunity. I always go for learning and discovery and with a weeding, uh, meeting with the people of all uh, occupations, artists, musicians, doctors, lawyers, city planners, farmers, coffee plantation owners. We were able to explore the complex history of uh, Cuba, its natural beauty, and of course, all the many cultural um, riches uh, we have, they have. And of course, we went to three different places. Um, we flew from Miami to Hawaii, Havana, uh, and we spent the night in Miami um, I would have preferred flying to Havana because it's only, what, 224 miles as the crow flies and 90 miles between shores. I've also included the Bay of Pigs on this map because you'll we will refer to it later. Now, just a little of the Cuban chronology, chronology um, and its history. We've been involved with um, the uh, Cuba for many, many years, as you can say as you go down the list, um, we were, um, you know, in 1898, the Spanish relinquished control to the U.S. in the Treaty of Paris, and then we left when Fidel came in with his revolution, and then 
that we put in Bargos and the Bay of Pigs and Cuban missiles. And we'll be talking about some of those things as we go on. And of course, uh, Obama easing the travel and Trump, you know, restricting it again. And here again, to just show you how close we are. Um, Batista was very, if you remember, was uh, very um, friendly with the big American corporations. And at that time, um, the U.S. was involved with um, about 40% of their sugar plantations, 80% of their um, mines, and 90% of their utilities. So they were very friendly with this. But once he um, was ousted, by the revolution by Fidel Castro, uh, who converted Cuba into a one party socialist state under the communist rule. We left and many of the uh, Cuban exiles left also. Um, they Their property was confiscated. Um, he brought in um, minimal private uh, residencies and no private property. He encouraged the, the you know people for the slum to go into the high rent districts, and uh, of course he also uh, promised them free education and free health care, which you know really was a boom for them. And of course um, his sidekick through much of this time was Chez, and of course he was quite a, a gentleman, very bright, uh, not only a guerrilla leader you know, looking for places to revolve, but he was also a physician and an artist, an author. And after Fidel uh, died, uh, his brother took over. And um, it's interesting, while Fidel Castro died, our guide, who was a young woman of 30, said that was the first time in her lifetime that she was without music for nine days because they had a moratorium and you know uh, no music during that time and of course we're all the brother was much more open you know he wanted to open it a little bit and um he's still very much in charge because as the first check secretary of the communist party um he has the final say in anything economic or political and of course, his uh, person that he, um, you know, uh, chose to follow him was Miguel Diaz Canel. And of course, he's so young that he had never experienced any of the 50 year dynasty of the Castro dynasty. And so he is to carry out all the po uh, policies uh, of Royal. And here's just some facts that might you might find interesting about it. Um, I think one of the things uh, the most of uh, the Cuba's labor force is controlled and employed by the state. Um, when I was there, supposedly the monthly salary was $25. I understand it's up to 30. And of course, <clears throat> their main exports are fish, medical products, coffee, citrus fruit, tobacco. But also might be interesting is the military and the doctors. Um, the military was sent to um, South Africa for their apartheid. It was also sent to Angola in their three decades of civil war. And I hope you'll notice that uh, Cuba has a literacy rate of 98, 99.8, which is wonderful. And you can see the population of Cuba is about 11,500,000. And during this COVID, um, they have been praised by the outside world how well they have handled it. Because with that population, they've only had 4,000 cases and only 95 deaths. So they have done very well. And of course, we're going to be seeing some architecture, visiting the people and the street scenes, as well as the vintage. And of course, um, when we were there, they had two kinds of uh, currency. The peso is the local currency that, that was not valuable. And then we had the kooks and we were uh, you know, advised to make sure we had kooks when we shopped and got our um, change. And here's my scene from my uh, hotel. We were in the National Hotel, which is the boutique hotel from the 1930s 
with all the uh, accoutrements of chandeliers and woods and tile floors. And the next morning, we're off to see how the Cubans live. And you can see the colonial uh, influence with all these beautiful homes. And you can also see how some are really well cared for and some are not. Many of these you can see have been not only left to decay and crumble, but many times if they're on the Melicon, they have been washed um, with the water from the, you know, uh, the salt and see many parts are they're trying to rebuild as much as they can but their economy is very very poor and with no private property um if somebody can afford as you can see in this picture there's a person on the right can afford to uh, upgrade their property but on the left not so much and that happens all over the city you know here's a little uh, fixer upper for anybody and of course this is the famous malacan um, the five mile um, road along the shoreline and the seawall, uh, uh, looking all the way back to the city in Havana. And of course, here again, as I mentioned, these are the evidence of the building that has been crumbling because of the seawall, uh, uh, sea salt and water has been, uh, you know, approaching it. And we can look back to the fort and the castle, which is well taken care of. They don't need it for protection anymore, but at one time they did, and you can see how it's built right into the rock. It gives us a view back to Havana and also shows you where many of the uh, cruise ship previously would come in. Now, they do not have the infrastructure with, you know, thousands of coming in at one time, but, um, you know, since uh, Trump has uh, restricted it, um, they, you know, aren't sending as many people. Now, here's the Melicon. It's beautiful water. And, of course, one day we were going out to dinner and um, the waves were coming over and over. We couldn't go to dinner. We had to change our plans. And then I want you to see what really happens. <laughs> This is the famous Malacan, where people are traveling back and forth to work. They're sunning, they're swimming. And I just want you to see it on a sunny day, and then you'll see it on a cloudy day. You can see it in the the beautiful accoutrements on the buildings. And you can see how high the seawall is, looking back to the fort, back to the city, people sunning, different upkeep on the buildings, depending on who. And here is a stormy day with the water coming over the seawall and crumbling the buildings. The sea salt is just very difficult on the buildings. So welcome to the uh, Cuba, the country that the time forgot and is frozen in time. And of course, I'm sure many of you uh, realize how the, how they've made um, such a wonderful collection of antique cars. And of course, these cars um, prove to me that the people are very resilient, resourceful, and reliant because they've turned them into beautiful cars um, by necessity, taking care of them, and they've become taxis. And of course, now they're worth a lot of money. An American car collector, automobile collectors would love to have them but they cannot leave the country. And of course, you can see one very bright blue one along the Melicon. They have all kinds of transportation there again. Um, those were the former cruise ships that were bringing thousands of foreigners like Americans and Canadians. And of course, you can have a little buggy ride. Um, they honor their heroes. Um, this is Chez. There's their uh, monument to their poet, Jose. And of course, we have Fidel and Chez again. 
But some of the best times we had were going out to eat. Their food is delightful. And there again, everything is government controlled, the um, hotels, the restaurants. So these um, very resilient, resourceful people in order to have make men, uh, means meet and you know, succeed in raising their families, have opened their restaurant, their homes to restaurants called Palidors. And Palidor in Spanish means pallet. And this happen, one happened to be in a former uh, sugarcane uh, area. And of course, the sugarcane um, industry in the 20th century uh, was, you know, in control of the U.S. and the Russians. And at the time, with all of this sugar, you know, so many tons being sent around the world, um, they were um, hiring um, 30,000 uh, African slaves to help. Um, you know, harvested. And of course, you can see this is the early uh, the 20th century and they're uh, inside. Uh, a local clown was going to give a party. And as I say, Um, as I say, um, I really feel that all the Cuban people are born with music and rhythm in their DNA because no matter where you went, on the streets, um, in the hotel, in the restaurants, uh, they were singing. And of course, we visited uh, several churches and it is a very, you know, there's uh, a lot of uh, religious faith there and beautiful windows. And one of the churches we visited was a senior center. And here are the, some of the seniors we met. The gentleman on the right is a, you'll see him in a minute. He is a opera singer. The lady on the left was a truck driver. The one on the left was, is a teacher. The other one was a nurse. And so um, uh, we're going to have two people sing for us. And I want you to notice the young woman, woman on the right. Notice how in uh, touch she is with Chanel and her cross and their you know, double earrings. So let's listen. Now, many, maybe many of you could uh, uh, translate that. I'm sorry, I can't. But their enthusiasm and their vibrant spirit, you know, is contagious. They got us to dancing and uh, we brought gifts. We were in, uh, encouraged to bring uh, small things like the things they could sew with and toiletries and um, kitchen things because they have a hard time getting them. And of course, we visit the um, many squares with a uh, variety of people. Looks like this dad's on duty today. And then, of course, we have the beautiful costumes of the women. And, of course, you can have your um, fortune told or buy some flowers. And even in Havana, they have uh, a cafe, uh, a cafe Paris. And uh, here's another one of the outdoor uh, Palidors, which, you know, offered wonderful food. Um, this was one of my favorites. It was tiny. There's usually only, you know, four or five or six tables in the, somebody's living room. And I thought the 78 records as a placemat was very clever. And notice the 66 route and um, gas pump. Um, and of course, you probably know the most famous drink there is the mojito. And it really is delicious. And um, not only is there music all over, but there's art all over on the streets, on the walls, uh, in the markets, colorful, and uh, dolls. <laughs> That's a hot spot where they're all using their cell phones but they have Wi-Fi. You can see the uh, African Cuban. And one day we were off to the beautiful park, uh, their botanical gardens, and people feeding the pigeons, the children. And 
we met this young lady and you can see she has a sign and she's working for the government as a guide in the uh, park to tell us about it. And of course, she was close to 90 and very proud of it. And their flowers are beautiful. And then we met an artist, uh, Jose Fusto, and he went into a barrio and find that the, um, and he's been all over, and he's a visual artist and he bought a little house and he wanted to improve it. And so with mosaics and sculptures and tiles and um, uh, colors, he transformed this little burrow from something that was not so clean as to something beautiful with benches and paintings and tiles in the front. In fact, you know, any of his neighbors wanted him to do their, their houses yet to also. And of course they can sell their uh, beautiful artwork. And we were treated to a uh, <laughs> dinner at this restaurant. I want you to notice that little girl. I just loved it. And notice that uh, instrument. <laughs> and of course, um, our group was very sedate. Now, I have to tell you, in that last scene, our group um, had some very um, dignified people, four retired judges from Seattle, um, several doctors from the East Coast. But, you know, when you're in Cuba, you, you know, you live like the Cubans, you dance and you sing. Here's our lovely 30-year-old uh, um, guide, Yannette, and she was wonderful. She had so much knowledge to share and so much history, and she's the one that you know, at uh, Fidel's morning, nine days of mourning with no music, found it difficult. And of course, as I say, they're resourceful. So these people uh, have made taxi, uh, bicycle taxis, and we're about ready to go to the market and see what they're selling in the market. Here was our driver and he was ready to go. And we could find fruits, we could find meat, how about some onions, and of course, rum, and then as you're walking along and, you know, just looking, it is fun just to look at the doors and the grills or the uh, decorations. And in each doorway, there is young, there is old, they're friendly, they're high fine um, They're just very outgoing. They, as I say, they want to talk to you, ask questions. And now look at that. Um, not only is that a place to sit, but to me it was very artistic how they did that. Um, they're resilient, reliant, and resourceful. And there's some more people up and down. And then we had the wonderful opportunity to visit an orphanage run by this tiny, teeny woman on the left. And she took us in and explained, you know, that many of these children had lost their families and such. So. Um, Children to me, uh, smiles are universal. And then of course, th these young people. I have to say, um, the children love to have their pictures taken. And if you had your cell phone and you could show it to them then afterward, they were just thrilled. And so in contrast to visiting the orphanage, then we were also, you know, visiting some of the um, uh, old uh, colonnade and uh, colonial buildings that were their uh, town halls and their um, post offices and some of the beautiful homes. And of course they had the modern uh, downtown. And this was one of the uh, cemeteries we visited. It's very historic cemetery. It has about 100, 800 uh, graves. 
And after three years, if they need more room, they dig up people and put them in, you know, uh, a certain area. And then, of course, they have about 500 mausoleums. And you can see the size and extents of these made out of marble and slate and just um, beautiful. And, of course, even a uh, chapel. And this particular area <clears throat> is the one of the, uh, the miracle. It's called the miracle. And it's where the women come and bring their prayers and flowers and hoping to become pregnant. And there again, you can see the size of them and artisticness of it. Now, uh, a few days later, we we're off to San Flagos, which you can see right from the architecture, the influence of Haiti and the French and the Louisiana and such, and their beautiful buildings in the, in the square one more beautiful than the other. And of course, it was all the, we could walk down to the uh, shore because we also visited a college and their well-known choir. I have to tell you, among this group, after we listened to their concert, um, they introduced themselves and told us how long they had been with the choir. And we were surprised that uh, six of them were relatively new, under six months. And we were curious about that and I asked our guide and she said, wait till we get back to the hotel. And uh, this choir had just returned from a um, tour in the US and six of their members had deflected while they were gone, even a couple um, with two children left in Cuba. Now, I don't know the final story of that, but that shows, gives you an indication of what sometimes happens there. And of course, not only do they have musicians that can um, sing about their country, but they have wonderful dancers. And this group was about to come to Chicago. And uh, I want you to look at how strong they are and see how they... <laughs> This is in Dimmit. This is imitating the waves and the water on shore. And of course, on payday, since there's no, you don't have a bank account, you go and get your cash at the bank. And of course, we have lots of um, bicycle taxis. Now we're about ready to visit the government stores. As you know, everything in um, Cuba is government controlled and so you go to the store and find very small amounts of things on the shelves and if you want oil it seems like it is been in your deep fryer for a year or so at least and of course um you can get liquor that are eggs and they're you know dividing it into your particular um you know um amount that you're allowed more eggs. How about that for uh, some ground beef? Not sure if I would like it, but um, in talking and engaging with all of these uh, different people, uh, we were we were able to find out that some of them were very wish that they had an opportunity to. Um, be farmers because if a farmer had an extra crop he could sell it or have it for his family and if you're in town and you have only a certain allotment you don't get any, enough so here is you know his lot here again she's checking how much she can have and there you can say you know how many beans how many you know how much flour how much uh, sugar 
you know, sometimes you might get a fish. And if they don't have fish, you get a chicken and vice versa. And of course now, because they're having a liquidity crisis, they have begun to open up their country a bit and have these dollar stores. Now the dollar stores there, they are finding, um, you know, aren't really dollar stores by our standards because, you know, a pound of cheese could cost $30. Uh, you know, one little piece of meat could be $11. And not only that, um, a, a curfew has been imposed about, on Cuba since the pandemic. And so they have to be in their homes from seven in the morning, and five a.m. in the morning. And if they are caught outside at that time, they could get a fine of $125. And if you're only making 30, you know, that doesn't add up. And of course, they are, um, you know, looking, they've um, used to tax 10% on any dollars coming in, but now they want to open up the economy more. So they are, uh, they are encouraging dollars, which many of these people get from their relatives in Illinois. And to them, you know, hard cash currency, they're opening it up and hoping it will help their economy get reestablished. But if you have lived there, and you're a senior, you have to get your food there. And of course, when we were there, you could get some your um, furniture. How about this? You know, latest and greatest in tech, maybe, you know, 1940s. And as I said, <coughs> with the salary so low, many of the professionals have found they can make more in a push cart like this. You know, if a doctor and a lawyer, instead of working in the hospital, under the government, they can, you know, become much more enterprising, you know, selling coconuts. And of course, we stayed in this lovely little boutique hotel, and we could have a ride in the Ford. This was the lobby, and this was the uh, fountain. And it's interesting, when we came back, we'd always be serenaded. And there again, at this hotel, they had trouble with the water. So several days in a row, we were, um, you know, had a cold shower or no shower at all. And um, to make up for it, as we left, they presented us at the last dinner, a bottle of wine and a bottle of rum. And I didn't want to partake of it before, or any of it before I went home. So I thought, well, I think I'm gonna try to take it home. And of course my fellow travelers said, you won't be able to do it. But I wrapped it in my stockings and my uh, slacks put it in my soft side of the suitcase, get home, unzip it. And there's a little card saying the TSA had checked it, but my rum and wine was intact. Enjoy once I got home. And of course, uh, every night at our, um, we would have um, not a decoration on our bed. And of course, when we wandered around San Fagos, we saw these beautiful, beautiful buildings. They're known for their colored houses. You can see their laundry. And there again, visit the people, you know, having time fishing, catching fish, and transporting your pet. Wherever you saw people with their cell phones sitting together, that was a hot spot where they could get the best reception. And of course, children on the streets, having your hair done. How about Monopoly? Delivering the bread. I followed this little girl and she was so excited she was going to have her first manicure and such. So, and we visited, uh, you know, as you know, that their um, healthcare and their um, education is uh, free. So we visited many schools where they were learning dancing. <laughs> And of course, here is a future Elvis or a Beatle. And <laughs> couldn't enjoy it. But of course, the parents are so supportive and, you know, getting their children ready for all the various dances they're going to do. 
And here's even a Hawaiian one. And of course, they have such fun, and the parents are so supportive. And then we have also some um, of the adult music. And of course, now before we leave, we're going to the colorful Trinidad with its uh, colorful houses and its cobblestone um, streets. And of course, this is where a lot of the sugarcane plantations were, where they, you know, had imported the 30,000 uh, slaves to help. You can see how brightly colored they are. You can see all the cobblestones and the beautiful uh, electricity and the churches and the people and out. And we visited an arboretum. And um, here again, all the different plants and trees. And I was impressed. Here they have a palm that is being used as a waste receptacle. And of course, we visited more than one school and the children seem so excited and so friendly. Now, um, I want you to notice these young girls and dancing and see if they can wiggle their hips so well now what they'll be like when they're 16. <laughs> So what do you think of that? And of course, you can see the schools and they're very crowded, uh, big classrooms, but smiles all the way around. Um, this is their tech center. Think of your nearby school and what it looks like compared to these monitors. And of course, the students getting red, they always wear um, uniforms. And then we're on our way to visit um, a um, coffee plantation. And along the way, we meet this couple and, and try some of their wear, some of their honey. They invite us into their home and show us their kitchen. You can see their laundry, their sewing machine where they hang their clothes and all they sell their bananas and their onions and transport things, the children, the elders, and of course, the talented people who make baskets. I understand when they make the basket that it's very hard on their hands because the palm fronds are very, you know, um, um, can hurt them. And of course, this is the clay. And uh, this gentleman is going to show us how to make a vase. And of course, I have to tell you, that gentleman was the third generation in his family who did that. And of course, it's always for sale. And there again, wherever we go, we see families in every restaurant. There's a singer. If you're going to go to school, you ride your bike. How about this library? Think of your library. Does it look like this? Uh, maybe not the grounds. But look at, he's doing his research. 
Here's the card catalog. And of course, always a car in front. And now I want you to just wander around. People are taking care of their homes. We visited with this young man in his two room house with his three generations in one house and his his goal was to be a doctor and such and of course when we visit the artists um, they would explain and artists musicians and um are able to express themselves more openly because most people in cuba can't say anything for fear of jail or some repercussions but this gentleman was talking about the farmer and how important the farmer was and you can see the gentleman on the right you know the strength in his face but also the uh, sun beating down and you can see him carving it and we always got around with our uh, carts seeing people churches and the square there again some more music <laughs> the old the young and here is one uh, more of those paladors that I was telling you about, just three or four different uh, tables in the person's home to make extra money. <laughs> the pair, the tall, the short, of course, you know, the uh, Panama hats, uh, the music. And look at this, you can see that they've been making, um, you know, purses and uh, creating dresses. And of course, they are recycling things. And these are the people that, you know, can make more in uh, a little market than they can when they are working at the hospital. And when we get to the um, coffee plantation, we're going through the woods. This is their home. And as I say, there's minimal private property. They're opening it up more, a little more. Um, and of course, um, this gentleman is the third, his, he's the grandfather and three generation of family are working on this plantation, grandpa and grandma, and the young son on the right. And of course, the young son and his wife have three boys. Two of the older ones have gone to Havana. They expect that this is their home. They expect their younger son to go to the city like his older siblings, but he wished to stay at home and uh, be part of the family at, uh, plantation. And of course, as I told you, many people feel the, the neighbors, um, the uh, people that have farms, like this gentleman who's collecting, you know, coffee beans, are lucky because if they have extra, they can sell it to their neighbors or have it for themselves. Now, he explained to us it's not as easy as that because, of course, you have a contract with the government and you have an allotment that you have to fill. fill. And if the weather is not good and you are, you know, if you can fulfill your quota, it's fine. But if you don't in one year, you have to pay it the next year and such. So, but their setting was beautiful. And we did bring some honey that he had extra that he sold us. Of course, you can see their animals. And no um, trip to Havana wouldn't be complete without going to the fishing village of Kojimar where uh, a certain uh, author you all know uh, uh, visited with the fishermen and partook of rum and um, these are the fishermen he was talking about in the old man of the sea and we were impressed with these gentlemen because these boats that we saw looked like they would have been in our country um, to Kinlan, but they were repairing them and making them work or they'd be working on the engine and we'd say, well, what happens if you can't get it started? Huh. There was no question that they would or wouldn't. They would definitely get it started if they had to make the part or whatever. So they did. And of course, as you're wandering around, you can see the scenes, you can see the, sh the chef and before his restaurant, the little uh, upkeep, I think. But of course, the gentleman we're talking about is Ernest uh, Hemingway, who spent quite a bit of time there. He had a home there. We were able to visit it, his living room, his hall. And of course, then we climbed up to his studio and we could see the great view he had and we could see his typewriter that all his wonderful stories came to be. Returning to Havana, we of course had to visit a cigar and tobacco shop. 
And you must remember, realize that um, tobacco has been raised there for centuries. In fact, when uh, Columbus got there in 1492, he was really, you know, intrigued with it and took it back to his country and they started raising tobacco too. And of course now, to bring you up to date what's happening there now, as I say, there's a crisis, they have a liquidity problem and um, they have the masks. And um, I explained to you about the um, different fine they might get. And here again, they're wearing their masks and um, over 600, 800 medical personnel have been sent during this time because there again, um, they you know are helping and have done such a good job with their own. And so Cuba is like an aging grand dame where the colonial facade of buildings are crumbling, but the spirit of the people couldn't be more lively and vibrant. And of course, I feel that um, Cuba is at a crossroads, a country trying to preserve their unique culture and the achievements of the socialist government. They want investment from other countries and nations, but are determined not to allow countries to dominate them like the Spanish and the American, the Russians did for centuries. As I feel they are resilient, resourceful, and reliable. I also have to add that Cuba has um, their leaders in the past have promised made promises like this before. And um, they say that they have to wait and see if it'll really come through because there's not much transparency. So thank you very much. I appreciate it being with you. And if I can answer any questions, um, I'd be happy to if that's available. Absolutely. Thank you, June. I really enjoyed your presentation. So I have a question. What a thing mo or what event or place most resonated you when you were in Cuba? Was there a moment, a happening, a building? You know what? I think um, just all the people that we met, how curious they were, how upbeat they were, how they enjoyed life when you think of how little they had. I mean, I just came home with an appreciation and an admiration for these people that have gone through, you know, the Spanish, the US, the, you know, the Bay of Pigs, the missile crisis, um, you know, um, Russia, and now, uh, you know, the uh, communists. And as I say, they don't wanna give up their perks of their wonderful education and healthcare but they also want to move forward. Yes, and that may prove difficult with the um, government here putting all the stops and whist blows and whistles on Cuba. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they open it up and then they, you know, take it away. And um, as I say, they're really, from what I could do, I always try to update my programs and the research I've done, done uh, you know, in the last couple of days. You know, they really are trying, but whether it will work or not, uh, you know, uh, we will just have to wait and see. Yes, I can attest to how good their doctors are. My daughter, uh, I was with my daughter in Belize and we were way in the back country. And she had got bitten quite badly and we had to see a local doctor. And the local doctor was um, from Cuba who had been sent to Belize to help with their medical system because they were very short of doctors. So Cuba is doing a wonderful <laughs> job on the education front. Um, they have, you know, they have 99.8. And there again, they have too many doctors and too many militaries. And that's why they're sending them, uh, you know, to different parts of the world. And when they go, like the doctor you saw, I'm sure he's probably sending home a lot more money than he could save you know, staying home at $30 a month. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? One moment, there's some, um, 
I have got a comment from Larry, uh, Larry Usher, who says, fabulous presentation, June. We appreciate all your time and love you put into this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I love to travel. And of course, being restricted to no travel right now, it's fun to revisit all my travels. And I feel lucky that I've traveled as much as I have. <laughs> Hi, this was a wonderful presentation. I was wondering if you've, you had so many photos. I was wondering if there were any restrictions on what you could photograph you could take. No, you know what? We never ran into that. You know, I wouldn't take it maybe at the airport <laughs> or a public building, but I was never restricted while I was there. And, you know, I could take them wherever I was. And as you say, in, as you could see, you know, I was out in the country, I was in the city. Um, so there was no restrictions on that. Okay. Um, yes, do you have another one? Laurie Usher, how far away was the um, fishing village from Havana and how did you get there? Okay, you know what, um, uh, Code Jamar is only about 30 miles outside, and we went by van. I, I wish I had gone there. I just went to Havana, Okay, and that, that looked fascinating. It was. You know what, I think uh, I have to give some credit to Overseas Adventure Grand Circle Travel. I, you know, maybe made 13 trips with them. And what I like about them, they seem to give you a good do dollar value. And also, you get to visit with the people. You engage with the people. You cook with them, shop with them, uh, eat with them. Uh, you visit their schools. Um, you know, it's just, to me, when you go to a place, you want to engage with the people. And this was especially true in this one, when we had to participate in all the activities, we couldn't, you know, say, no, no, I'm going to take a walk or take a nap this afternoon. And how long was the trip? How many days? Um, let me think back. Um, I would say just about three weeks. Wow. So thank you, June. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. You had some wonderful photographs and it makes us all want to go to Cuba, particularly because we're all smoked in here. It's right. such a colorful, sunshiny place. So thank you. Mm -hmm.